And we're here. We're live. Welcome, everyone. Happy Wednesday, and welcome to Adobe Live. We're going to be doing graphic design today. And my name is Terry White, as your host, and I'm here with the wonderful Mary Rousey. Hi, Mary. How are Hi, you? Hi. How's it going? Great. We're going to see you do some graphic design stuff today? Yep. Awesome. We're going to be doing holistic branding, so a little bit of everything. Awesome. So. And before we get to that, let me do a couple house cleaning rule or housekeeping rules. Uh, so today we're going to do a chat and win. That will pop up a little bit later in the stream, and you're going to get a chance to win some very cool uh, die-cut stickers from Sticker Mule. And um, we'll announce that winner, and you basically just, all you have to do is chat. You don't have to design anything. You don't have to do anything. Just be present. Be human and chat. <laughs> With that said, uh, we're also going to do a daily creative challenge, which has already kicked off. So if you missed that, you can go back and watch Val's video. And today's challenge is to create an adventure game character, either using yourself or inspiration from another fictional character. Pose your character with Puppet Warp and add a movement effect with Motion Blur. And you have a shot at winning something cool there as well, like just winning the challenge. Oh, no, it's not really a win thing. We just kind of look at your work. And, uh, and you win a critique. You win a critique, yes. You win. Helpful feedback. You win, you win that I say... That was cool what Mary says. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at today's schedule. We're going to um, be doing some cool things all throughout the day today. So today on Adobe Live, uh, like I said, Val kicked off the uh, Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge already. And now we're live with the graphic design stream as well as an XD stream coming on later. And another design for any stream, any screen stream at noon Pacific time. So I see a bunch of people in the chat already. Hey, Jason, Steve, uh, Anat, uh, Kroll, Avinash, Cheryl, Kroll again, and Howard. <laughs> Howard's in the house. What's up, Tim? Welcome, everyone. And I could spend all day saying hi to everybody, but I think we should probably get started. <laughs> so, Mary. Yeah, let's make some things. Tell us about you first. Yeah, well, I'm Mary, um, as you've probably addressed by now. I think we said that at yeah. least once. So I'm originally from Wyoming, um, a large town in Wyoming, about 13,000 people, Rock Springs. But not a lot of people did art, and art was something that I always wanted to do. So of course, I started taking portfolio classes, applied to an art cool. school, and then was 18 and fell in love and decided, eh, who needs dreams? <laughs> So, got another degree, um, and then a couple years later, you know, realized I needed to do what I wanted to do. Out of curiosity, what I, what art school did you go to? I've never been to art school, so. Academy of Art curious. University. In Wyoming? No, here, here. actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was in Wyoming and realized I was doing the wrong thing with my life, and did a Google search for art mecca of the nation. San Francisco came up, mm -hmm. and then did a search for art schools. Cool. And then I came here for six years. And I think we were talking earlier, you, you, you spent some time in Nashville. Mm-hmm. So went to Nashville after that and then moved up to Seattle where I'm there now. Uh, worked for an advertising firm in Nashville, brand marketing firm, Urban Influence in Seattle. And I uh, decided to go out on my own last year or year and a half ago. So I started Ember Creative, um, which is kind of a creative collective. So this is the website here and awesome. we'll do a refresh so you can see transitions because that's always fun. It's always important. Um, but originally the intention was to be an agency and, you know, realizing that I had a bunch of friends that I had worked with for a really long time and we were used to working together, but we were all kind of freelancing or doing our own thing. So building this as a creative collective, so a place where we can just bring our skills together and make amazing things. So have our team of people and amazing skull graphics on top, because why not? Um, so we started doing that. So we just, we do some creative work together, uh, environmental projects, uh, brand design projects. I also teach brand for musicians at Zoo Labs here in Oakland. So uh, teaching musicians how to run they're, you know, singing, songwriting careers as a business, doing design. Wow. So you do it all. Yeah, doing that. Um, I'm also part of a cannabis design agency, too, called Ritual House. So this is some of our work for that. So I team together with the owner, founder of Urban Influence to make Ritual House. Mm -hmm. So we also do some cannabis design. So that's always a lot of fun to be in an industry that, you know, 
largely hasn't been designed for until the last few years. Cool. And so, besides your website, where should people go follow you? Um, so they can follow me on Instagram. Uh, I just launched the website and everything a few months ago. So the Instagram handle is Ember Creative, same as EMBR Creative as the website. So yeah, follow on social. We'll start kicking that off more and doing that stuff and then posting blogs, content. Um, I love teaching. I love, you know, sharing insights from being in design, which is why we're doing this. So. All right, people are chiming in saying they love your site. Oh, wow, very cool and love the packaging. Well, thank you. So uh, tell us a little bit about, before we kick into what you're, you're watching you do, what you're gonna do today. So tell us, give everyone like kind of a heads up, what are you going to do today? Like, what's the goal? Yeah, so earlier we mentioned holistic branding. Um, which was kind of a term that had its moment in like 2014 and then it became this big marketing buzzword term and it kind of fell off the you know face of the earth but i feel like it's a really appropriate term for what we're going to be doing especially now when you're looking at you know having a logo there's so much more encapsulating a brand versus just having a logo so how does it look on social media? What are the secondary graphics? What are the print materials? Do you need print materials for what you're creating anymore? Um, does it apply to packaging? Does it apply to like menu cards or things like that? So I'm gonna be working on a skincare company um, and I've been working with her. She's actually a friend of mine who became a client. And so it's been a lot of fun in the process cause you get to have a little more fun with it and you know, get some nice feedback and stuff like that. But she's developed a natural skincare line. So we started off doing a basic creative brief, which I'm gonna show. Um, went into the naming process and then we did logo and brand identity and mood boards last week. Okay. She just chose her logo on Monday. So today we're going to be taking that logo, um, making any edits, extending it out into secondary graphics, maybe yeah. making some patterns, um, doing a social media kind of guide for her so that when she's posting things, what should she be posting? How should it look? What templates can she use? Hopefully we can get through that today and maybe some business cards and print materials if we can. And tomorrow we'll do packaging and anything else we didn't get through today. Exciting. So. All right, and one last thing before she kicks into her work. Uh, just a re reminder, if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks, but all the action's happening at behance.net slash live slash Adobe Live. If you wanna really participate in the contest, the chat, if you wanna be recognized, that's the place to be. All right, so let's see you do your thing. Okay. Well, and also, so in the chat room, people are asking um, the difference between Ember Creative and embercreative.com. Um, oh, you already mentioned that so, earlier. <laughs> yeah, so originally when I received the creative for the Adobe Live, they put the E in it, um, which is also another like environmental brand company, and I think they're out of Boston. Um, but we launched around the same time, so I am just EMBR Creative, um, so, although they do some great work too. Right. No relation but... <laughs> to EMBER. You're EMBR. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't get the trademark for EMBER, so I went with EMBR, but that's the difference. They are two companies that right. do very similar things. Not related. But they do great work too, so. You know, you can't go wrong with them either. So. But we're gonna drop the, we're gonna stick with you today. Yeah, right. we'll stick here. All right, let's do it. Okay. So I'm going to get out of. And if you have questions uh, related to anything she's doing today, uh, I will try to monitor the chat at the same time I'm watching her work and we will ask your questions while she works so she doesn't have to look up at the chat every day or all day. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm gonna start just going through, backtracking just a little bit, um, to talk a little bit more about the process and what we've done to get to this point. I know I get a lot of questions about, you know, how do you dive into brands? What are the questions that you ask? Um, how do you isolate, you know, what their taste level is or what they, you know, kind of lean to aesthetically because, you know, entirely what we do is subjective. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to know what they like and what their personal taste is, even if it's not appropriate for the brand because you can kind of know where they're coming from. So this is a creative brief that I usually start with and we do these in person. We don't always have people fill them out. 
Um, but we like to go through a little bit of who they feel like the audience is, so who's interacting with their brand, um, and especially if they have any data that supports it, because a lot of times people might just be thinking, well, I'm doing a skincare line, so of course younger people are gonna want it so they can protect their skin the rest of their life. But it's not always the case when you actually, you know, do a test launch of the product or and get feedback from certain demographics or groups of people that like it more than others. So at least just establishing that baseline. And then also who they want to connect with, um, being really specific, not just, I want to appeal to everybody. Because right, yeah. that's typically the answer. Um, if there's a specific goal, so if they have a new product launch, um, if they're just rebranding um, because they're not getting as much traction as they used to be, uh, establish credibility. Maybe they've been in this industry for a while and they just want to you know, establish themselves as a big player, kind of take that next step. And how long does this take, this process take? So usually we'll do a kickoff meeting that's an hour to an hour and a half long. Run through these. I like to do them in person if I was possible. Gonna, that was my next question. Is it in yeah. person or are they filling this out online? Yeah, and sometimes you can send them to them early. So then that way they can look at them, they can think about them. Especially one of the questions that I have on here about a spokesperson, people usually need to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually do five adjectives. What are you? What are you not? Um, sometimes people have an easier time with the what are you not versus the what are you because they're like, well, I don't know what I am. Right. But they know what they're not. Um, anything that's mandatory, you know, working in design, sometimes you'll have a logo that there's brand equity in or a specific color palette that's strongly tied to the brand. So you can't change it. So you need to know what those mandatories are so you can work around them. Um, and this one, people what, always need time with. What's been the strangest with. mandatory you've gotten? I think it was like an illustration from their child. Not That also <laughs> happened with this project, but it was in a good way. Right. You see this on my refrigerator? But it has to be <laughs> in the brand. Like this drawing yeah. from my son or daughter has to be there. Yeah, and it's funny because that's the scenario I use because we're actually doing a very similar thing in this project, but it was actually a good illustration. Got it. Um, but there's been ones that you kind of have to talk them out of it a little bit. Um, this spokesperson question is always a really good one to get further insight on who they feel like, if they had to turn their brand into a person or pick mm. a spokesperson for it, they have to start thinking about attributes. Um, so for this one specifically, um, she was looking at like Selma Hayek because she's yeah. refined, um, you know, she's obviously really beautiful, but she's also kind of approachable, she's a little sassy. Mm -hmm. So having some of those you know, brand attributes, it kind of helps you describe what you want your brand to be without thinking of it specifically. Got it. If that makes sense. Makes sense. So a lot of times that'll help non-design people think about it in that context. And then of course, just the quick reference stuff. Um, Very cool. Competition, brands, um, looking at brands that you think are visually stunning. So this brings in that personal preference portion of it. Um, and then what you think would be good for the brand or company. All right. So. so let's see. Alexandra, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a fan. And Noor says your website is better than theirs. So very cool. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, let's see. Welcome, Columbia. And I see a question here. Uh, do you have any templates or recommendations for creative briefs? Something to start with or try out? So I had started just building mine you know, through the different companies and the different years and what we learned at the academy and what I learned from the brand marketing firm that I was at, um, to kind of build the questions that I felt resonated the best. That being said, I don't know, I'm sure there's plenty of them so, out there, uh, but I don't know of a template specifically. And I would expect for something like that, you really do learn what the questions are as you go through these processes. Mm -hmm. you know, as you do the work, you start to figure out, oh, it would have been nice to know this up front. Yeah. And you kind of build your own, but. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and especially yeah. like as a creative and like in your life in general, you need to think about like you as a designer, what's going to help you design better versus just asking a list of mandatory questions as well. Um, I found that these ones gave me the deepest insight that I could work with as a designer and creating color palettes. And, you know, if they see something that 
they list something as their competition and that competitor is all red, I immediately know that I'm not gonna pick red for something because you don't wanna have some of that overlap. Right. Um, so think about you and a designer and your process too, and then ask the questions that are gonna get the information that you need to be more effective. Now, as they, let's say they've answered all your questions, you've got the, you've got the brief in front of you, do you then go out and still do some research to see who their competitors are and what they've mm -hmm. done? And yeah. So you still do your, your, your groundwork as well. Yeah, so I'll build a ton of social media mood boards. Um, like we'll use Pinterest a lot just to pull visual assets. We do a lot of split mood boards. So I'll add the client to a mood board and they can start adding things to it. I'll start adding things to it. Um, and then in the comments, we'll just write, I really like the color palette for this one or I like the graphic style or things like that. Um, so that way you can just, it's all about getting on the same page and making sure that they feel good about, un, that you understand their brand and you understand, you know, what they want to be and what they're aiming for. And I mean, building that relationship is always a big part. So this kind of helps you do that. Very cool. So. All right. Yeah. Um, but also on the like template front, I don't know any templates, but um, you know, stay tuned on the blog on our website because I am going to start producing more content. Um, education and sharing assets is always a huge thing for me. I think it's all the designers are better if we share assets and, you know, I don't consider anything really proprietary because if it helps somebody else, then great. So I'll probably eventually be writing a blog post and posting some of these things that you can snag and alter for your own. So I was going to say that might be something just to even add value to your, to, you know, as a brand for yourself, just to say, hey, here's a template you can download. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's one of the reasons why we ended up going to a creative collective. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's like if I have a skill set and you have a different skill set and we exchange information, we only get better. Right. So share information and, you know, everybody gets better. So. Perfect. All right. People are loving that. Uh, is it Kalibek? Welcome. It's your first time here. All right. Awesome. So, oh, and Carmen's posting some um, templates that they've found. So that's awesome. Yeah, share information. Yes. Um, so the next thing that with this project, like I mentioned, we did naming, we did the logo design, we did mood boards. So the first thing we did was naming. So based on all, all of those creative brief information that I grabbed, I started researching, um, thinking about a few things. So the client's original name was Andy Bees. Um, her name is Andrea. And she makes natural skincare products, so no preservatives, nothing like that. It's all just like all natural, mm -hmm. you know, shea butters, cocoa butters, yes. stuff like that that's great for your skin. So she originally had it called Andy Bees with the nuance of the bee behind it because, you know, nature and honey and right. beeswax and all that stuff. I got it. So as we were going through this, we wanted to retain some of that nuance um, and make sure we didn't go too far from what she already was, but give her something new and fresh. So a few of these options that we went through, um, Andy B, so just kind of adultifying mm -hmm. what she already had. Um, usually when I go through these, in this presentation, I'll add a little bit of a description of why I found that name or why I picked that name or if it's a created word, what are the two chunks from? Is it from a different language? Is it just English? Um, and then also available URLs, because as you know, it's so hard to get a domain name, yes. especially a small, like very simple well, one. You can pretty much give up on .coms now. Yeah, yeah. everything's .co or .shop right, right. or, um, and then also if there is competition, because it's always good to know, um, you know, who else is out here. And then you can field any questions if, you know, your websites get mixed up like the Ember Creative thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a great example of that. Yeah, um, put it right on your right on the, um, main page of your website. We're not them. <laughs> but here's their website <laughs> right, if you want to check website, them out too. There, yeah. <laughs> Hire who you want. Right. <laughs> They'll just take the East Coast side and yes. we'll take the West Coast side. It's totally fine. Um, so we looked at, you know, B Lux or Bumble Lux. Um, Bombini, uh, which is actually like the tribe that Bumblebees are I in. I don't know why I like that name for some reason. Yeah. Like, it's fun. I, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Well, and it speaks a lot to like bath bombs, yep. and but it also has like the nature side. But bumblebees are one of the biggest pollinators. Um, but they're also the last type of bee that's actually in this category. Hmm. So if something happens to the bumblebees, there will be no more bees in this category. Um, so looking at that one. And these are just a few others that we presented. 
Um, so she actually did go with Bombini. Hey. So see, there you go. There you go. Right there. <laughs> Boom. Yep. So. And I did not know that up front. Yeah. So the next presentation that we did, we got to use Bombini on it. Mm -hmm. um, so then we went through the brand identity. So a lot of designers I know or, you know, other creatives that I've worked with, typically when they present brand or logo designs, they'll do a mood board, logos, and sometimes a brand extension from that logo. Um, but I divide it a little bit differently. I found that when I was presenting mood boards with logos, a lot of people were kind of Frankensteining things, saying, you know, I like these few images from this mood board, but I like this logo, but so I like that, this color palette. So that's the client doing that. mm -hmm. yeah, picking and choosing. Okay. Yeah, well, when you show three great options, right. of course people are, right. you know. I like this color, I like that type, yeah. I like this, yeah. Well, and then they get to feel like they were part of the process too, mm -hmm. and they had some say in it versus just like selecting one. I mean, obviously you'll have some clients that they're like, you're the professional, you know what you're doing. Right. You know, but then uh, some try or, to art direct a little bit. Or like me, I'll know it when I see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nope, that's not it yet. Yeah, so I usually like to separate them so that they can have that power to decide what they want. Um, so we started out with mood boards. So gave her three options of mood boards. Um, and I'm naming all of them. And one of the reasons I do this is so that when you're having a conversation with a client, um, you can actually refer to it by name versus the first concept. Wait, which was the first concept? Yeah. Because, you know, when you have them in your files, it sense. might have been the third one, yep. and then you switch them around for presentation's sake. So if you name it Clean Touch, it's Clean Touch. That's a nice tip. And then you also, I'm putting, you know, some of those adjectives that were pulled from our discussion that I got from the mood or from the creative brief and putting the ones that have the strongest influence on this mood board here. So for clean touch, um, a lot of whites, a lot of brights. Uh, this illustration with the, the dandelions and the legs and the butts was actually an illustration from her daughter. And she sent it to me during the- Was, was that one of the must haves? Yeah, it was not one of the okay. must haves, but it's super cute. Yes. Um, like I was saying, it was one of the ones that somebody's like, my daughter made this thing for me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's really cool. So wanted to incorporate it in some way. Um, and then just keeping everything light and bright, you know, skincare, you know, showing a few things that are either packaging or card based, but not so much so that it's fully you know, defining what that secondary graphic style is going to be nice. or what those typefaces are going to be, but just the overall mood. So talking about the color palette or if we do product shoots, what is that pro like, what is the environment the product's going to be in? Um, do we show people's faces? Do we show people washing their hands? Some of those visual cues. Okay. The second one we named Vibrantly Fresh and did you know, really bright, a lot of energy, bringing it back with some really saturated navy blues. And one of the other things that I like to do with the mood boards is showing pretty different things. Obviously, they're all gonna be in skincare. Um, you know, we can skew them to speak to the adjectives that she picked mm -hmm. regardless, but looking at vastly different visual styles. So you can really nail in. Can you go back to the previous one for a minute? Yeah. And now the, the new one? I uh, definitely like the colors in this one. Yeah, so it has a lot more energy. It's more of yeah. that vibrant feel to it. Um, so using florals a lot here. So when we you know, take photos of models and skincare for the website, you know, do they have bright flowers in their hair? Do they have a bright makeup? You know, is a color attributed to each person in this brand? Mm -hmm. So looking at it more in that way. And even the spring logo there, like it's it just this one just feels better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and bringing in a lot of the florals because with a skincare line, it's like you're going to be using lavenders or maybe essential yeah. oils or. And here I am know. pretending I'm the client. It doesn't really matter what I think. <laughs> but it does matter what you think. It's always good to have that feedback and the thoughts of you know other people. Absolutely. Um, we All right, so we have a question. Did you did you compete with other companies? I mean, before the client. Makes their selection, uh, how are you paid? What if the client decides to go with another company? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this one specifically, um, she was already a friend of mine. We met about a year ago when she wanted to engage this process, um, but she wasn't quite ready. She wanted to try out a few more skincare products and you know, make sure her line was really solid before we started on the brand mm -hmm. process. So she had been kind of saving up so that she had a budget to work with me. Um, 
sometimes I've gotten requests for RFPs. I don't typically start doing any work until we start working together. Um, I feel like having my website and you know showing people my work. So question then, like this, the, the boards you've shown, shown mm -hmm. us so far, would this be considered work or this is not work yet? This is work. So this is work. Yeah. So this is a signed contract you're engaged yep. at this point. Okay. Anytime, I mean, we'll do an initial meet and greet, talk about the project. I'll talk to them about my capabilities. I show them some portfolio pieces that would be relevant to what they're doing. Um, but to me, it should be the blend of personality and me already showing what kind of work I can do. And I feel confident that I can make something for that person. So talking to them about their goals and, you know, and also part of it is when you have that initial meeting, bringing in some of the brand strategy side of it and that business strategy, because obviously most of the people that you're going to be working with are business owners. Mm -hmm. So they have an understanding of, you know, what is their return on investment? Um, what are their brand goals? What Hopefully, are their marketing yeah. goals? Yeah. Most of them, right? Yeah. Um, so talking to them in that way about, okay, who is your audience or who is your audience right now? What are your brand ideals or your culture, you know, your values, things like that. And then what is your goal? Is it to sell more products? Is it to get more followers on Instagram? Is it to, you know, compete against another brand that's kind of edging you out a little bit? So talking to it like that, you know, helps sell them on the business understanding side of it and then showing them your work but yeah, I don't start doing any work, the creative brief, until they decide to go with me. Okay, so once they've decided to go with you, is there, like I said, I, I mentioned contract, so I'm assuming there's a contract at that point. Mm -hmm. And in that contract, do you state that, or is there a clause or anything that says, you know, what if that, like the question basically says, what if they just decide that it's not working for them and they wanna go somewhere else? Yeah, so when I make my contracts, um, I usually like to do them project-based if possible. Mm -hmm. So. I will make a contract that says, here's everything that you're gonna get. I figure out approximately how long that's gonna take me times by the hourly rate. So I'll have like a range of what that hourly rate would be. So you know exactly, okay, I cannot go over 125 hours or it'll dip down between below my lowest hourly rate. Okay. So then I'll say, you will get a logo. You'll get a round one presentation of logos and mood boards. You'll get a round two presentation. Like you'll select one of those. You'll get feedback. I will make the changes of that one. And then you approve. So okay. it really defines, here's the few levels. Here's exactly what you're going to get. And then this is the price for it. So then that way, once you sign that contract, you know, obviously if they hate the work and they don't want to do it anymore, then I'm not going to make them pay for that. Right. Because okay. if you're not happy with me, then that's fine. That's honest. Yeah. That, that's that's so, that, kind of like you answered the question. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Perfect. All right. We are less than two minutes away from the chat and win countdown, but we're going to talk for two more minutes. Yeah. A, a minute and 46 seconds. Yeah. So let's go through the last mood board and okay. then maybe jump into the chat and win and then Sounds go through good. logos afterwards. Perfect. Um, so the third concept that we showed was earth made. So this was more on like the artisan craft care handmade side of things which has a lot more toned down colors, um, more a lot earth, of- More earth tones, yeah. Yeah, more earth specifically. So even just rocks in the, you know, the product photos or having some plants or just these deeper, richer colors. Um, and also Tim's asking, so no cancellation fee. Um, a lot of times to start any of these projects, I take a deposit. So depending on the person, it's either a 50% deposit and Oh, it says my page on Dribble doesn't exist. Um, so I'll do a 50% deposit. So if they do cancel, I'm still keeping that deposit. 25% yeah. if it's somebody that I've been working Makes with sense. a lot. Yeah. So you do get something out of it. Um, I think on my Dribble, it might just be my personal one right now. So if that's posted, right, sorry sure, about sure that. She'll fix that. Yeah, we'll fix it later. <laughs> so we have 37 seconds to the chat and win. All right, so let's see if there are any other questions. Um, there should be a kill fee, right? Well, yeah, yeah. she explained it. So the deposit is not refundable, yeah. basically. Essentially, the deposit is yeah. the kill fee. Right. You keep that regardless, and if they want to bail, they totally can. I mean, if they're super upset and they really hate me and everything that I've done, I would much rather give them, you know, their money back and yeah. 
Then be happy. And then for them to go out telling so. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take our chat and win break right now, and we'll be right back. All right, so we're back for the chat and win. And at this point, basically, how you win is to simply chat. And if you're joining us just now for the first time, uh, my name is Terry White. I'm here with Mary Rozzi. And she is going, she's taking us through actually some important business part of the graphic design process that I think we don't always spend enough time on. So this is good. Um, we, you know, I like to spend time just in the software and jumping in and doing tutorials and stuff like that. But it's like, this is the stuff that really makes separates you from the amateur to the mm -hmm. business professional. Yeah, well, and it's so easy these days because there's beautiful design everywhere, like on Pinterest and Dribbble, and there's it can be really easy to get overwhelmed mm -hmm. and just jump into those, pull inspiration from them, and make something that's very similar to it. But if you don't have the you know business strategy and those ideas and the concepts behind it, then you're just making something to look pretty, and it's also mimicking stuff that's already out there. Yep. So it makes it more difficult to create something original. All oh, right. we have a winner. We have a winner, Stacy Brute. Stacy, you have won. Good Let's, job, Stacy. I shall tell Way you what you've won. You've won. 100 free 3x3 three three die cut stickers from Sticker Mule. And we will private message you on how you can collect them, but we do have a consolation prize for everyone else. If you didn't win, you can head over to stickermule.com slash Adobe Live 19, and you get a deal. You get 10 stickers for a dollar. Can't beat that. It's like, what, 10 cents a piece? Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. All right. You can put stickers on everything. Stickers on everything. But nothing right. illegal. At least 10. Keep the city clean. Yes. <laughs> Put stickers on your things. Put them on your laptops. Right. You can represent. This is I, my control Z, my I, command Z. I, I'm sticker free today. Oh, you're I so am fresh even, and so I'm clean even, and clean. Um, I'm even uh, skin free today. I normally have a skin on my laptop. Oh. But I'm using this dark cover. Yeah, I always like my, I got this sticker. There's another illustrator designer named Colton Flores um, that designed these that are amazing. But I always love it because... You know, Command Z. You can always well, was, you can always edit undo it. So it's, it's funny. Always a like good I used to have, I used to have a skin where I was like down in the corner, like on stage presenting, and so I'd go through the airport back in the day when you used to take your laptop out, and they would be like, "Is that you?" And I was like, "No, I just found this <laughs> skin, and it looks similar enough." Just I bought it. Yeah. So, so TSA. Yeah. Go to win. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. All right, we're back at it. We're back at it. Um, so in the second section of this uh, presentation, now we go through logo design. So I'm not putting any colors to any of these yet. It's all just black and white um, and showing concepts. So concept number one, so showing a brief mood board of where you know some of these came from and some of the ideas and then just talking through what my approach was for each of the logos. So looking at something simple, typographic based, but having a little something extra to it. So maybe it's talking about, you know, the water and it's having those waves or the way that you put on skincare products. So having some of those swoops. I, I and tend some to of do those. like this. Uh, like, yeah. yeah, yeah I, <laughs> or the patting. Right. No, no, not the patting. Just <laughs> to the splash. That'll be our next. Tomorrow on Adobe Live. <laughs> <A> tutorial. <laughs> we're going to be washing products. our face. Yes. <laughs> so then doing a next slide of you know, about the water drop and the water lines and just a little example of where that contextual thinking came from. And then uh, showing the first the name. logo. I love it. So Bombini in its first form, um, I'm using Dirty Skin Clean Care for just a fill-in tagline. So mm -hmm. something that I can work with as a secondary graphic. Um, just to give it a little something extra, because you can always remove those things and just have the simple like letter-based logo, which you should. You should have that whole series anyways. And then showing it on black and white so they can see what the reverse out is. It's also helpful for you because you can always see and if you have a really thin typeface. Well, John says nice logos. I tend to agree. I love, well, thank I love you. these. These are great. <laughs> so with this one, you know, because if you have something, say it's in a Dodoni typeface, so mm -hmm. you have those big thicks and thins, you can see if you're going to lose some of those, especially if they're going to be printing business cards um, and you're going to have that right. ink bleed. Right. 
you can see what it's gonna look like when it scales down and reverses out and, you know, kind of kill some of those problems before you even show a client and they fall in love with something that's not gonna be great in the long run. Very nice, I agree. So some secondary elements of it. So maybe you break it up so it's the bomb beanie um, with that tagline. So just second iterations of it. And then also this was an alternate uh, that uh, kind of fell out oh, of. Oh, the ones I've seen so far, this is the one I, I just, I keep getting drawn to because I like mm -hmm. the separation from the tagline. I like that, you know, it could stand by itself without the tagline. This is just, I love this design, it's great. Thank you. Well, we went back and forth on how feminine should it be, how masculine should it be, because although most of her current customers right now are women, she also has, you know, like a beard shave oil and a shave soap and some of these things that might need to be skewed to men eventually. Mm -hmm. So trying to make, they are loving you on the chat. It, it's just me. <laughs> We're here to see Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. It's good to have the love. It's good to have love. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, wanted to show her, but, you know, making sure that we can skew it masculine at a certain point was also, you know, just kind of in the back of our head as we're going through some of these things. So, concept number two. Again, similar mood board of mm -hmm where kind of inspiration was drawn. So keeping it light, fun, modern, approachable was one of the words that she wanted to have. Again, thinking of like bee wings. So how many ways can we bring in like the bees from okay. Andy Bees into right. the identity as well? So, you know, very simple versions of bee wings, water droplets, you know, infinity, keeping your skin looking nice for a very long time or forever ideally, you know. I'm, big. I'm impressed <laughs> by the amount of thought you put into even this. This is awesome. So then bringing in some of those shapes to make the B, so that water droplet mm -hmm. turned on its side to make those other letter forms, but then pairing it with something that's more of an extended typeface to kind of balance out all the geometric shapes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So uh, again, I see the water drops turn on their side for the Bs. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to make a water drop upright for the O. Mm -hmm. Why not? It got to feel a little too much. Too much. Okay. I did some iterations where I was using um, the little B, is it a hex, hex pentagram? I forget my shape names. It's yeah. been way too long Hexagram? since I've, I've named shapes. Um, a six-sided yeah, entity. Hex, correct. It's hex something, yeah. hexagon. <laughs> Help us out in the chat. Yes. <laughs> Um, but, you know, integrating that into the O and it just all felt way too forced. Okay. So I figured we could integrate some of those things on, you know, the secondary executions versus in the logo itself. That works. Because like we had mentioned before, a logo is such a small part of your brand identity, or at least it should be. So again, looking at on black and white. And then some secondary extensions of those. So having the you know drop or turning it into a flower, um, and thinking about how could it apply to other products or other things. Julia says hexa hexagram, and Yuri says hexagon. hexagon. I, I thought hexagon. I think hexagon is probably. <laughs> I could be wrong. But I thought wrong. hexagon. <laughs> Uh, so the final concept, concept number three. Um, I usually show three to five logos, and if I show... So they're asking, do you have a Behance, which I'm assuming you do. Yes, I do. Um, it is Behance Ember Creative EMBR. Same way as is on, nope. I don't know what side I'm on, it's reverse up there. <laughs> yep, I do that all um, the time. Same way as the laptop. So Behance.net slash Ember Creative. Yep, yep, that's it. That's Behance. Um, so showing three, if I do show five, the other two are probably alternates for one of the logos. So just like I showed in the first concept, it was that monoline topography, and then the second one, that alt of it, would technically be a second concept, but it's mm -hmm. like a one B. So if I show five, it'll be something like that. It's three distinctly different brands, and then a one B or a, you know, three B in them. One so. B, three B. Well, and I noticed if you get too far beyond three, it starts to, you know, especially if they're taking like a panel vote on things, which most people do, or if they're taking it back to a board, or if Designed they're getting their family committee. feedback. Oh, no. Yeah. 
Um, no, so then do at it. least it narrows it down to one, two, three. Yeah. If you have five, it ends up being, well, I like number one and I like number three. Can, Can you we combine merge those them together? together and see number 12? Yep. Yeah. So it's also one of the benefits of making distinctly different ones that could be appropriate for the brand because there's less, you know, you're going to look at the icon from one and the logo type for number two and say, okay, well, obviously those things are going to go together. So it's easy to kind of push back on, another, we're not going to Frankenstein another this. Another <laughs> great tip is that the concepts are so different that they can't Frankenstein them together. Yep. That's, that's another awesome tip. And then also just having the, you know, creative ammunition from the creative brief and from, you know, that ideation process. So you can say, well, with this logo, it's more on the approachable modern side. So with the photography and the secondary graphics, we need to make sure that we bring in more of that, you know, artisanal handcrafted element mm -hmm. to it so that you can balance all of the things that you want versus doing a modern mood board with a modern typeface. So kind of telling them about the balance and making sure that you're offsetting some of those things so that they have the whole gamut of what they want to communicate. Awesome. So, so concept number three, um, taking more of the luxury approach on it. So mm. some lighter serif fonts, um, you know, maybe having something a little extra or an icon integrated with it. So again, looking at the hexagon, thank you, chat room. <laughs> um, pulling all these hexagons together um, with some larger shapes to create more of a flower icon using those hexes. So a little bit of the bee, a little bit of the nature, but in a really intricate kind of luxury mm -hmm. version at, of it. And at first glance, it almost looks like a honeycomb. So. Mm -hmm. Ah. So this was the third concept. So again, tying in that dirty skin, clean care concept to it. Looking like at it on one. black and white. Yep. That's my favorite so far on this concept. And then how does this extend out? So, you know, if it just has dirty skin, clean care on the bottom of it, um, if you are going to look at herbal soother cleansing greens, like what are those product names? How do those look once they get into the system? So you'll notice also on all of these, I'm giving us a different talking point for each one. So for concept number three, showing them that all of the... Uh, the products can kind of come together in this specific system, whereas the other one's talking about, you know, more of the icons. So maybe we have a different type of an icon or a different arrangement of those modern shapes. So. All right, so people are chiming in on the third one. So, ooh, this is my favorite, third concept for the gold. And loving the way the hieroglyphs communicate uh, about uh, the designs. So, Noor, I agree. Awesome. So at the end of this, I also like to do a comparison slide. And well, right, one, one thing real quick, Ray's asking, is the white space intentional? Yes, it the is. The amount of white space intentional. Um, so usually when I'm presenting a lot of these things, it's either on a larger screen, it's not typically on my laptop, or they're pulling them up at home. But if I get them too big on the page, it just overwhelms them um, because it's a lot to look at. So just keeping it nice and smaller on the page, it's. Good stuff. Another good tip. Yeah. So comparison, I love doing the comparison. Um, a lot of times during these presentations, they'll be like, oh, well, can you go back to page four? Or can you, okay, now jump to this one. So if you just have them together in one slide, mm. you can start to have this conversation. So I did one for the mood boards um, with their names. So clean touch, vib vibrantly fresh and earth made. So. You know, they can say, you know, I love all the white space, but I love the colors of number two. So it kind of brings it back so that you can have that discussion. And then, of course, all three logos together so that then you can have that compare and contrast, right. too. So it's more about just facilitating the conversation than anything. All right. I do like number three, which is now in the middle. Yeah. But I'm still a fan of the third one. Which one do you think she picked? Oh, no, nah, no. Nah, see if I can pick two for the win. <laughs> Which one do I, so she definitely picked one of these three. Mm -hmm. She picked, all right, I would pick the one on the right, but she probably picked the middle one. You're right. She did pick the middle one. Um, she was actually in love with this one over on the left as well, the really modern one. Mm -hmm. So these two were kind of the front runners for her, but she did pick the middle one. Um, her committee, all of the third one as well. And she also liked the, you know, conceptual thinking behind I, this I icon. I wish I knew my clients as well as I knew yours. <laughs> <laughs> like I could 
just tell what your clients pay. Yeah, well, and of course I had a little bit of an edge because she is my friend too. And so being able to know what her preferences are and that kind of stuff, you know, kind of helps out a little bit. But that was the one I was hoping she would yeah. go for as well. So Some people are chiming in with their choices. One, three, <laughs> two. <laughs> yeah, they're all so different and fun, so. Yeah. Okay. But so, it, 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 here's the thing. With any one of the choices, she couldn't go wrong. Yeah. Well, so thank you for that. So they're great. Yeah. Um, so that's where we were. So on Monday, she picked that middle one. Um, so now we're just going to dive into working on the rest of the stuff. All right. Let's do it. So. Let's watch you do it. Yeah. I feel like we need music. I never design there without is, music. There, there actually, <laughs> there probably is music playing in the background. We just don't hear it. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yeah, we just can't hear it, oh, but there man. is music. Otherwise, it'd be this weird echo thing going on. Yeah. Um, so, and actually, I'll bring open my... So the first file that I work on, um, this is kind of a cleaned up version of it too, but also I do loving this because it streamlines my process a little bit more when I'm ideating and kind of designing some of these things out. All right, so let's back up for the people that may not just know things at a glance. So yeah. I'm going to narrate some of, some of this, yeah. not, not the design part, but just the technical part. So she's in Adobe Illustrator and she's using multiple artboards. Mm -hmm. And is there a particular size for the artboard that you're using and the reason for that size? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm doing 11 by 17. Okay. Um, you also could do, you know, 1920 by 1080 if mm -hmm. you may, you know you're going to be presenting on a screen, something like that. Um, but I do them at 11 by 17 because my presentations are also in 11 by 17. So you'll see that I'm in the exact same, you know, ratio here. So this way, when I'm actually setting up my file, which I believe I might have one of these here too. It's easy to sync, update, and if you make some adjustments. Oh, except I just messed up my link on my presentation slide for that because I changed a page in my number one. Um, but you'll see I have them in artboards. And then with the layers, I have two layers in here too. So when I'm designing out my logos, and this is one of the things that I learned from the Academy of Art, because in any of our um, like identity design, Thomas McNulty, uh, we always had to produce 150, 100 to 150 icons or logos during our conceptual phase. Okay. So it was always really easy to set it up. And now I'm gonna have to math live which is not going to be pretty, um, but I believe it was like... You can make up the calculator. You know? no, <laughs> yeah. no one will call you out on it. <laughs> Doing, you know, five down the side and ten across. So then that way you know, you know, I need to make three pages of these okay. to hit my 150. Got it. So gridding everything out. And that way if you have an internal presentation too to a boss or a creative director or just get feedback from your team, if you have A, B, C, D across the top and one, two, three, four down the bottom, you can print them all out. You can look at them and say, I love page one, A1. Everyone's saying 150, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy talk. It was insane. Um, yes, and I agree with Xavier. Uh, we are not mathematicians. Yeah. So not, not my strong suit. I live by that calculator. Um, <laughs> But again, just facilitating that conversation and you don't want to show, you know, clients this. This is kind of for your own internal purposes or to show for internal no, review. No, less is more. But, if they saw all this, they would go crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it just facilitates that internal conversation so that you can vote for which ones you want, which ones you want to go to a client presentation. So bringing those in, um, and then just making that grid on a layer that you have that's separate from the others, and then you can lock it, so then that way, you know, when you're shifting your other logos around, it's not gonna affect what you're doing. Cool. So I'll also create mood or art boards for the way that I have them in the presentation. So this way, as you're going in through your presentation, even though I messed up my link, um, you can just have them in the page, so I'll set up all of my headers and footers in master pages. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so now switching gears because she said master page. I was like, wait, yeah. the Illustrator does that. Oh, you're so in I'm InDesign. I'm bouncing yeah, around. You're in InDesign now, okay. <laughs> Um, so in the InDesign presentation, I set everything up in master pages so that you have your cover, your dividers, your headers and footers, and then any specific content pages that you use a lot of. And that's, that's I'm, I'm impressed. So that's very cool that you're doing the presentation even in InDesign as opposed to Keynote or PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons why I like doing it this way, again, because Adobe has seamless products. Um, <laughs> That was a plug. <laughs> <laughs> but because they do work so well together, what I can do is you'll see that I have my link. Oh, back to the Illustrator file? No, this is still in InDesign. No, I mean the link back to the Illustrator oh. file. Yes. So, oh, I'm in my master page. I'm guessing. Get back to a page. Okay. So if I click on this link, why is it? Well, typically it would highlight the link that I'm on, but I have so many links in here. Do you actually have it selected? I think yeah. it's because I didn't update it. Oh, the joys of being live. live yes. Well, typically it's somewhere in these millions of links. This is only a bad thing about putting your mood boards directly into InDesign, because then I have a million links. It's not really oh, a bad there, thing. Is that the one that's highlighted at the top? No, that's just a link that I moved. At any rate. We won't, we don't need to find it. But what you can do is if you have your presentation, because I build the presentation while I'm doing the design. Okay. So as soon as I have a logo that I know that I want to present and it feels clean and it feels good enough, I, I'm pointing to my screen like you can see my finger. Um, you build them out in these artboards so that way you can link them directly into this. So. You just put all of the pages in, and then you can hit Command D to change out that link. So now, say if I want to, you know, add in another file, you click Show Import Options mm -hmm. on your Illustrator file. You hit Open, and it'll open a dialog box where it'll show you a preview of what page you're putting in. So you can say, okay, this is the, you know, this is concept number one. I need to show the black and white logo. One of my own. So that was the third one that I actually designed. So I can see the little preview there. All I right, hit so OK and just, it'll just as a recap. Out. So you're you're placing from the multiple artboard Illustrator file mm -hmm. one of the artboards into InDesign for the presentation. Correct. Got it. So then that way you have them all laid out in this way. And say if as you're designing things, you already have your three logos and you're like, oh crap, I just made another logo that I really like and I like it much better than this second logo here, you can pull whichever one it is. Well, I'm not gonna change it because this is my original file. Um, but you can replace out this slide here and then when you go, you save your file, and then when you go back to here, it'll tell you, that you the just been update updated. the link, yeah. and then it'll replace this logo in your presentation. So that way, you're not saving out JPEGs, or you're not copy and pasting it. It just makes it super duper easy if Very you change nice. your mind, yes. or you do something else, and it automatically updates them. And actually, that would be a nightmare trying to do that in PowerPoint slash Keynote. Yeah. yeah, and the other benefit of this too is that once you finish all your logos, they're in your presentation and you're ready to go. Right. You don't have to finish your logos and then take another day to build your presentations. So and are you actually using InDesign to present at that point? Um, I save it out as a PDF at that okay. point. So then that way, if I have any links to competition or audience references or just anything that I need to link, you can put um, an HTML link in it. So mm -hmm. say if, Okay, so say this is a specific model that I think it would be really great for her to work with or something. Mm -hmm. um, you can control click on it, go down to hyperlink, add a uh, new hyperlink. Like, yeah. Add whatever you want, say okay. So then that way when you do the export, You can save it as an interactive PDF, and then that way, 
she'll see that it's a live link and you can say, you know, click on this and the references there. Very so cool. she can click on that image. It immediately takes her to the website. She has all of her references that she needs and it's mm -hmm. not like an email string that she has right. to keep going back Side and forth. Side note, go ahead and cancel that for a second. This is for the audience sake. Um, if you go here, down at the bottom of the tool panel, click. On the little arrow? Yep. There we go. So you see um, presentation at the very bottom there. Mm -hmm. So you can actually Ooh, present yeah. from InDesign. So if you wanted to show your client like live while you're there connect to a projector or they're looking at your laptop and you can just put InDesign into presentation mode. Mm -hmm. That's great. And present your brief. Yeah. Um, we're also getting some questions. I don't know if we should answer a few questions. We probably should. It's my job. <laughs> should be asking you these. That's okay. Do you create a font? Uh, do you create a new font in your branding process? Um, yeah. So it just depends on the client and what we're doing. So I'm also working with a company called Family Fun Center, and they, like, they have the licensing rights to Rocky and Bullwinkle, and so they wanted to redo their brand and do more of the Al Kilgore style of like pop art and going back to those old comics um, for all of the graphics of the building and the environmentals of the space. So we extracted a lot of the letter forms from his handwriting in those comics to make some of the, like when rebuilding some of those yeah. comics so we can make large format artwork that goes on the wall. So with something like that, I took all of those letter forms and created a typeface just so it was easier for workflow. Um, but I usually try to find something that's either similar or just works with the brand. So that way, when you extend it into, you know, websites, things like that, it's it's cohesive. But you know, you can't always put a custom font into things. Um, some of these are custom fonts in these logos. Some of them are not. Mm -hmm. So for the third one that she did choose, um, that one is just a font. Got it. So. But All it right. has the icon so to kind of make it proprietary. A couple tips in the chat. Yeah, people in the chat are giving tips. So one Perfect. is one that keeps co coming back is that you could use XD for your presentation, and that's absolutely possible. Um, people are using XD more and more for things besides just prototyping and just uh, UI UX design. So um, presentations from your Adobe Concepts would be another way. Another thing was that I saw in the chat a minute ago was that not only couldn't the hyperlinks be to a web page, but they could be to a different page. Mm -hmm. So just another tip. Yeah, yeah. So you could always hyperlink. You know, in this mood board example, you could hyperlink all three of these photos back to the full mood board. Correct. So that way, if they were talking about an image that was also in that mood board that you're not representing here, it takes them immediately back so that they can kind of interact with it a little bit more versus. You know, just trying to talk about it. Again, facilitating that conversation. Yes. We're just going to keep saying that word. <laughs> but, so. This is awesome. We'll see if we even get any designing done today. Well, you know. Going through the, the process. They're, they're still young. I think we still have, like, at least an hour. Yeah. Well, we have feedback. True. So yeah, I know. Yeah, we'll but do that, that, too. that won't take. We have a half an hour. Long. We have a half hour before the design yeah. feedback. Well, and I've always found it really interesting because as you know, in a lot of the Adobe products, there's about 50 ways to do one thing. So every designer has their preference. Some of them are, you know, more straight. I'm sure there's quicker ways of doing things than I even do them. Mm -hmm. So if you see I'm doing something and you're like, No, no, hey. no, no, don't challenge her. <laughs> <laughs> the chat will blow up with, do it this way. Use do this it this way. Shortcut. Do this instead, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some ways are better. Sometimes, you know, people like doing it a different way that you might know about that I don't even do. Absolutely. So. Everyone has their own workflow. There is no right or wrong. It's just what works best for you. Yeah. That's what I usually tell people. Well, and that's why it's great that you're doing the Adobe Live stuff because, yeah. you know, you get a, the deeper insight into how everybody works. So I had already kind of gone through, and because she chose that icon, I started experimenting with patterns in the same way that I experimented with those secondary icons. So taking that hexagon um, that we started with, and if you have the typical kind of beehive, mm -hmm. you know, honeycomb pattern, how that would look in more of an abstracted interpretation of some of these things. So how they can be layered in different ways, um, if it's offset at a 45 degree angle versus if it's offset vertically downward, 
um, or horizontally. So they all create you know, this distinct pattern that we can eventually use in some of the packaging too, um, or some of our print assets. But what I also need to do is go through and extend out some of these icons. Okay. So these were some of my initial interpretations of it. Um, I think this one's still a viable possibility for one of the secondary icons for maybe a different product or something. Mm -hmm. um, but we do need to design out a few more of these. So I'm just ungrouping the one that I already had. And I'm just gonna pull one shape out of it. Kind of the different sizes. So I'm just gonna align these to get them centered in one another. So back in the Illustrator? Yep, we're back in Illustrator. Um, and then I'm back in my grid too. So I usually work in my grid if possible. I am organized chaos. It'll be chaos until I panic and then organize it all. Got it. So try to start out with it if I can. But. All right, so how are you with deadlines? Are you the person that got it done three days before it was due or you're the person up at midnight the night that it's due? Um, I usually try to get a jump start on it just because I'll have so many projects going at one time that uh, I can't. Can't wait. <laughs> so, yeah. and then on top of, you know, teaching and doing all that other stuff, it I try to pre-plan because then if I'm prepared, I can articulate some of those things um, during the presentation. So right now I'm doing offset path, which is also a great tool if you are using different type of shapes or you're trying to layer things inside of one another and you wanna make sure that they're evenly spaced. So I have the first hexagon selected, went to object path, offset path, and I can preview it so I can kind of see, okay, if I need to go down a little bit. I was gonna ask if you were doing that manually or if you were using one of these commands to do it, that's great. Yeah, I mean, this shape is easy because you can technically scale it, but yeah. a lot of times if you're doing a rectangle, if you just scale it in the you know, in the window itself, you're gonna end up with weird margins right. around it or a rounded corner. So it's always good to do that. And then you can, you know, I didn't get it quite centered there, so I can all adjust right. it a little and bit. And Ashi is asking, so how do you keep yourself up to date with all the updates? Uh, do you find it useful for your workflow? Adobe's constantly updating, which is amazing. It gets easier for each, every time, but mm -hmm. you know, I typically find a lot of designers see an update, they install it, but they still keep doing things the way they've always done things. They don't really always learn the new way because they don't take you know, they just don't have time to do it or take the time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your process for learning the new features when they come out? Um, I mean, I'm probably like a lot of designers where I'll avoid them for quite some time and mm -hmm. then I will do it. But then, you know, luckily because they make so many updates, they're very incremental. So it's like, okay, only that one tool has moved or there's an extended capability of one tool previous to the other ones. Mm -hmm. But if you wait to update, then it's like the whole thing right. changed <laughs> and then you're just screwed. So. It's almost better to just stay on top of it than try to. And that's actually a good approach. Is just keep the updates current and just learn the, the one, two, three, maybe 10 new things that were added as opposed to updating once a year every six months and have to learn 50 new things. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of experimenting with some of these. So when I'm copying these, I'm highlighting all three and I'm doing uh, Command C and then Command F to paste it in place. So that way I'm pasting the vector object right on top of itself. So then I can group it and just rotate these ones specifically and then get rid of that guy. So, but some of these aren't quite as intricate as I want them to be. B, get it. B, I got it. Be creative. <laughs> so get rid of that outside shape. Everything gets a lot smaller on screen once you're mirroring your display. <laughs> So um, I see one of the comments in the chat about uh, in Photoshop, we remove the requirement for having to hold down shift key to scale everything, which mm -hmm. I love, but some people don't. Well, that threw me off. Yeah. 
Yeah, because now when you hold shift, it doesn't keep the proportions, right. so it went opposite. Yeah. So that was actually the scenario I was just thinking of when you asked that question, because I was having a rough time with that, was it a couple now, weeks ago you, when I finally did updated? Did you adopt or did you switch it back? I adopted it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, because I mean, it definitely makes sense because now you don't have to hold that key, right. but. So, but for the people that say, nope, I don't want to adopt it, I want to go back to the old way. Um, in the latest updates Photoshop, there's a preference to actually just check the box and go back. So you can go to Photoshop's preferences and switch it back. And so right now, one of the other tools that I turn off and on a lot, which I probably should just make a quick key for if I can, um, is scale strokes and effects. Mm -hmm. So when I'm designing things in my initial concepting, I'll keep it on because then that way I can design something, scale it down, put it in my grid. Whereas when I'm actually designing them, I don't want them to scale so that if I'm taking one of these shapes and I want to scale down this portion of it to be a little bit tighter, um, it'll keep the same line width. Whereas if I did it the other way, it wouldn't anymore. So. Got it. And that's important. So basically what that's saying is that if you draw something at you know, a four point line and you scale it bigger, does the, do you want that four point line to get thicker or do you want the object just to get bigger? Mm -hmm. So you have a preference on which way you want that to happen. So just continuing to explore some of these things. Um, once you get more into these secondary graphics, you know, you can kind of take more time and look at, you know, how many lines are you starting like to put into that, some of these. It looks like the flower and the hexagon at the same time. Yeah. Well, and, you know, some of these initial ones, it's like, okay, this one has the complexity that might be comparable to this one, but they have di very different feels, right? So you're looking at the line work in it, and because you have some of these shapes closer together, it starts to make a thicker line in the center. Um, it's spikier, it's not quite as friendly, it starts mm -hmm. to have this optical fill to it. So, although good to explore, you know, I wouldn't consider yeah. them in the same brand identity. And Alberto brings up a good point. It's like, uh, it would be nice if Illustrator and, and InDesign did the same thing with the Shiki, then it would be more consistent, and yeah. Alberto, you never know, stay tuned. You're gonna have to use your powers, yeah. Terry. <laughs> those, those powers may have already been implemented, you just never know. Yeah. Probably be in the next update. All right, your words, not mine. <laughs> I, I make no not, promises. Do we have not. like a disclaimer that runs? You can across make all the, the promises you want. <laughs> I can't. I'm just a guest, so yeah. it's fine. <laughs> but stay well, tuned. You just never know what might happen. You never know. All right, we are 22 minutes away okay. from okay. our design feedback based on the daily creative challenge of designing a character using um, yourself or inspiration and uh, using a puppet warp tool to pose the character. So I'm seeing some cool entries over on Discord already. I know it's early, but um, there's some people that have already submitted theirs. Nice. How many submissions do we have so far? Um, two, two, three, four, handful, a couple. Voodoo Val's already put hers in for inspiration. Nice. Also, another thing that I really like um, that was like an update a few years ago, I think, but when you have something selected and you hit command, you know, the hyphen or the plus, it'll zoom into whatever you have selected. So that's always a nice thing. So, because I lose myself a lot of times yeah, in artboards. You lose yourself. <laughs> Get buried in my own artboards. Um, I get super, do you guys get super hunchy? I find myself doing this at my laptop, which is why I have a chiropractor. Good stuff. No, but I do find myself like, Instead of looking at my phone in a normal view and just using my glasses, I'm doing this all the time and bringing it closer when I don't actually have to. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a weird habit. And so obviously I'm gonna wanna like really align these eventually at some point, but right now I'm just kind of doing it quick for, you know, our purposes, but just starting to explore those a little bit. So 
I would keep doing these. I mean, I already have one that I could probably incorporate into some things, um, which we can explore more later, but I don't want to spend a ton of time on it right now anyways. Um, and what point size are those strokes? This one, it's a 1.271. Oh, right. Very, very precise. Specific. Very specific. Yeah. Well, and I was scaling these, so usually I'll... Because 1.3 is just too much. <laughs> just too much. <laughs> I always end up with weird point size lines. It'll be like 1.15 because it wasn't quite what I needed. Yep. Um, or, for example, with this line, like it's a 0.478 because I was trying to match a visual thickness of what this eye or the end was ah, and okay. then making it just a well, tiny bit thinner. A, there's a reason for so, it. It was just more about the, you know, the consideration with what it's surrounded by. So. I do need to start making some of the other icons for the other products. This guy there. So pull it in. Make sure I'm Gonna have the same line width on these. Yeah, now see that that one looks too thick at that size now. Yep. And then also taking in, you know, considering what this looks like. So even if I take down this line width, you'll see that right now, if I have them over, you know, the top of one another, they're pretty close in size. You know, vertically, anyways. Mm -hmm. But the one on the right hand side here looks a little bit bigger than the one on the left hand side. And it's because we have this solid shape that's going all the way around that just makes it feel bigger. So it's a, whereas the white space is kind of bobbing and weaving around right. the edge of this. So you want to think about it optically. I mean, one of the tips that I always heard for UX design when you're planning like buttons or icons or things like that is put it in a circle versus putting it in a square because you'll get them more visually appropriate versus if they're both in a square because a circle in a square versus a square in a square will look very different. Hmm. So centering them in the circle instead is great. So, but if I make it just a tiny bit smaller, you know, they visually look a little bit better. Six, five, okay. Eric says, so detailed. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it's all about the details. I remember when I was deciding which uh, degree to get in at the academy, um, one of the admissions reps was describing to me the differences between the illustration program, the advertising program, and graphic design. And the description for graphic design, he only took just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and put it on his desk and then just poked it tiny bits and then looked at it and poked it again for like a minute. Okay. He's like, this is what graphic design is. I was like, yeah, I want that one. Yeah. The obsessive compulsive one, Got give it. me that degree. So that brings up a good question. So like the time you spend, let's just say playing, mm -hmm. do you ever find that you're spending too much time for what the job is worth? So that's and one of the have to pull back. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I like having the parameters of having the contract, saying exactly what I need to accomplish in that contract, and then adding up about how many hours I think it's gonna take me, and then pricing it there. Because then you know, okay, if I get it done and I stay really focused, I make a higher hourly rate. If I get distracted and want to go down the rabbit hole or I propose something that isn't necessarily, not necessarily in scope, but it's something that you want to add to your portfolio or you really like the client and you think it's appropriate for it, then you can spend the time without saying, hey client, I know that you like that, but that's going to be X amount of money more. So kind of gives you the liberty to do whatever you want and, you know, okay. within client approval. And have you ever gone over your estimate and regretted it? No, because I only go over for a good reason. Okay. Like I want to do a specific illustration style or photography would really, really help the project. So, okay, so now that we have just a few additional elements, um, we have about 15 minutes left. So maybe I'll start doing some of the color palettes. 
So Ray asked the question I asked her, I asked her before we even started. Are you using a mouse or a stylus? Yeah. No, she's using the trackpad. Yeah. Oh my God. Also, I have a chiropractor yeah. <laughs> from the <my> carpal tunnel. <laughs> um, when we were having this discussion earlier, I'm a really heavy writer. So when I press on a stylus, the rubber on the pen just like falls off of it after a few months because I hold it so aggressively. So it just became a lost cause for me to use a stylus, but I do have an iMac at home too that I'll use a, a mouse with, but. So I'm just gonna screen grab this guy. And. I screen grab a lot of things just for quick references. So, um, you know, some of the Adobe Live episodes, I saw some designers that, you know, they'll either make up their own palettes from scratch or they eyedropper a lot of things. Right. I'm one of the eyedropper people. Um, I love pulling these colors from some of these okay. uh, And boards. Joe's asking a very good question. So what strategies do you use to politely nudge, <coughs> to nudge clients um, forward or out of the things that they really want to hang on to that are de detrimental to their brand? Yeah, so this is one of the huge benefits of having that creative brief in place at the beginning. Because once you establish, okay, my five ad adjectives are approachable, artisan, you know, whatever the other five are. Um, if they want to keep, say, an illustration that was created by their niece and they really love it and it's hot pink and it's of a unicorn, <laughs> you could say, well, you know, unicorns are approachable but that color of pink is a little bit more vibrant than what would be appropriate for this audience because it's an older demographic or you know it can be really hard to see once we balance it with some of the other colors. So you use that creative reasoning to talk them out of it. So it's not a, no, you're dumb and you didn't go to design school, we're not gonna do that. It becomes more of a, well, this is what's appropriate for the brand. We agreed on these adjectives from the beginning. Do you feel like we need to alter this adjective list to accommodate for using that thing and then adjust the rest of the brand, which would be a change order, by the way, because we, that was ah, not included. It would cost you money. It would cost you this. money. Um, <coughs> or do you feel like we could make some alterations to it to get back into you know, whatever those adjectives are. So you use the rationale of the brand versus, you know, I don't think we should do this. So that's using my approach on it. Got it. I like the, it'll cost you more if you want to keep it. Yes, uh, business professionals always <laughs> respond to, well, I would love to do that for you. I would love to do that for you and more, but. But. Time or money. Do you have that in the budget? Yep. Um, so another tool that I really like to use, if I'm laying something out, using Command D or to- Transform again. Transform again is always nice, even though I don't have these perfectly spaced, but we have the Align tool for that. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah, distribute. Yep. So I'm gonna make my color palette in a hexagons because fun. So I'm just gonna sample some of these. and then we're going to adjust them. You have fans that love the trackpad. <laughs> we need like a cult of trackpad. I'm a trackpad person all the time until it comes to retouching. I have to have a tablet for that. Yeah, well we were talking about, you know, the edges on things or like smoothing hair. Yeah, I gotta have like pressure that. sensitivity for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm, kind of want a teal. I'm gonna have to, so one of the other things that she did wanna do, although she picked mood board number one, she wanted to pull some of these brighter colors from the Vibrantly Fresh. Now, um, here's a tip. Mm -hmm. So if you select a photo, for example, just select one, go to your color picker and hold it down. She's in InDesign, so InDesign has this amazing color theme tool. Mm, look at that. And you click on the photo with it. Boom. That's fabulous. And you could save that to a library, you could save it to your swatches, and then if you save it to a library, then it's an illustrator, you can use those colors. That's great. And it also gives you options for colorful, yes, bright, for dark, colorful, deep, bright, or dark, muted. Deep. Yeah. Look at that. I love the color theme tool. I wish that were in other products. Wink, wink, Photoshop and Yeah, illustrator I was going to say, is that in Illustrator? Because no, be but really you handy can here. do it. There is a way to do it. <clears throat> Go to your window sure. menu. 
Now let me see if I can remember where it is. It is Let's under, it. nope, it is under, dun, 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 dun. Good time for a coffee break. Dun, 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 dun. Go to extensions at the top, near the top. Um, extensions, there we go, mm -hmm. and Oh, crap, I only have one extension. Hang on, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on, let me look. That's only the ones I'm I've... I'm looking at somebody else's computer that makes it hard. So. All right, keep working while I look this up. Okay. So her selection for these mood boards was taking all of the clean and simple look and feel from this first mood board, but integrating some more of these bright colors into that mood board as well. So although I'm sampling some of them from the original mood board, I'm going to kind of pump them up a little bit as well. I'm gonna need a neutral, so I'm gonna do gold for now. But I'm just double clicking on the left-hand side swatch to pull up my ah, color picker. Found it. Okay. Now tell me where it is. It's not extensions. Under under window again, it's uh, color themes. There you go. So that uses Adobe Color. And um, there should be, there should be, I select something. You can add two swatches, selected color. Should be a, capture ability with this. And of course, you can always use Adobe Capture, but there should be a way to do this in this panel. I mean, we could always explore. Let's see what they have in the way of clean. Yeah, that's also another way to look up designers' colors that they've used if you're just stuck and you're just looking for something. Mm -hmm. You can search. Well, and I don't know what your opinion on this, too. Um, you know, because Designers and people will go back and forth on, you know, I don't want to use somebody else's color palette, you know, where is that plagiarism, when is it, you know, yeah. that whole conversation. Um, and of course, now that we have the prominence of like Pinterest and Dribbble and all of these other things, creating something new can be really daunting. Um, but even just approaching it in a way of, okay, if I have a color palette from over here and you have you know, a graphic, maybe it's a monoline illustration style over here, but then I'm going to do this type of typeface and you bring all of those things together, that's when it starts to become something new versus just taking a color palette illustrations, all of that from one thing and then reproducing it for a new brand. So I don't know where you lay in that conversation because I feel like everybody has a different perspective on it. My perspective is if I go to like Adobe Color and I'm searching, those are designers that basically have said, I'm, I've created this cool color palette and I, or theme and I want to share it with the world. Mm -hmm. Those I don't have a problem using. But if it is if it is literally copying someone's color theme from their design and using it in mine, then I might have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. Especially if I don't alter it at all. I just simply take their colors and use them, then I could yeah. probably get... I could probably not feel good about that. Yeah. yeah. And it's always good to, you know, adjust a couple of those or add to right, the color that's what I'm palette. It's, or it's one thing to have inspiration to start from and then tweak it. But if it's just a straight up copy, then that's where it could yeah. be not so cool. If you don't feel good about it, then. Yeah, if I don't feel good, if I feel, feel dirty. Yeah. I need some clean. What does your dog think of you? <laughs> Is your dog judging you? Right. Be the person your dog thinks you are. It's always yes. a good rule to live by. <laughs> Struggling with this green right now. Greens are kind of tricky. Also, I think I'm in. What color mode I in? am I in? I always forget what color mode is there. Yeah, I'm in CMYK, so it's probably making them a little bit darker, anyways. Even though we're going to be doing some print pieces, I want to see what kind of colors I can get for the the website. Because we'll be updating her Shopify and all that stuff eventually. But. I'm gonna brighten these up now, kind of do a nice coral color. So someone's saying the model skin tone at the bottom would be a good, um, wonderfully, or good color to go with mm -hmm. for the background. Yeah, this purple tone is nice. 
or kind of a lighter, or she has a little bit more of like a coral purple in here too. Whoop, whoop. Did the thing, was selected on something. And we're about five minutes away from the design feedback. Awesome. So if you're um, wrapping up your, your, your character that you created, make sure you get that submitted to the Discord board for Photoshop. So then I can take some of these colors. And I always like to put them on in with the logo too, just to kind of get a sense of what it's gonna look like. And then I'll also present it in this way. So for the, actually I'm just gonna make, these won't be my final colors, but I'm just gonna make a swatch palette right now anyways. So I'm gonna hit new color group. So it saves these guys, we'll call it Bombini. And it adds them to my palette. Right now I'm going to select all unused colors and just get them out of my way for now. So I'm gonna delete them. few of these colors. That's a lot of colors right next to one another. These colors would never be next to one another anyways, but mm -hmm. you know, we're just designing and looking right now. And also another good thing about just simply putting them on some colors is so that you can see what colors you shouldn't be putting the logo on, especially with something like this because it has more of this, you know, in-depth line work in this icon, there's probably gonna be some colors, like if we did a light blush on this one, you're gonna lose that readability and you want it to be accessible to everybody. So if it's online, right. you wanna make sure you have that specific contrast on it. So people that are visually impaired or you know use a screen reader or something like that, that it's always gonna be, you know, they can enjoy it too and they right. can look at it and they can see it and they can appreciate so, it. So always use contrast. Always make sure that you have a high contrast on some of those things. So it'll help you determine that a little bit, you know, if you're losing some of those. So, we Pierce only have says, about. Pierce says nice color theme or color, um, you know, color scheme. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, we only have a couple of minutes, so I don't want to get started on something else. We can push that to the next week or okay. next day. I don't know where, where, where am I? Well, you, you, you. <laughs> Yeah, a couple minutes we can answer questions before we look at the design entries. Yeah, that'd be great. And let's see if I missed any up top here. We'll put a mood board on the screen just for something fun to look at in the meantime. So, um,. When you, uh, I have a question. So you said you use Pinterest for a lot of the mood boards and everything. Mm -hmm. Are you just searching? What like how are you getting the things that you're adding to Pinterest? Yeah. So I have the extension, and actually I could pull that up too. Although it might make me log back in. Had to, you know, do the yep, yep. do the sweep of the. Uh, you know, the Pinterest to make sure all the browser history was deleted and all yeah, that good, good stuff idea. because live TV. Right. Um, but typically I'll just make a mood board and then you'll see I've downloaded the extension on Google Chrome. For Pinterest. So, yep, so then that way, you know. Anything you select, you can just add to a board. Yeah, so say if I'm on this project, I can hit that Pinterest um, button it'll bring me up all the images that are on that page. So then that way I can say, okay, I wanna save this super rad car detail. Um, and it's not logged into my account right now because I'm not logged in online. But you can say, okay, if I'm gonna add it to the Resonate board, you can add it, keep it secret, um, and then add the client to it so they can do the same. So they can find things on Pinterest. I'll usually refer them to like All Ward, Styline, Site Inspire, those kind of Places, do, the you, hands. do you ever have the client, like do you instruct the client to say, hey, if you see some things out there you like, put them on a mood board? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it also gives you 
an in-depth understanding of what they gravitate toward and what their taste level is. Um, some people are business people. Some people are business people that think they're really good on the creative side, but mm -hmm. compared to like a designer or somebody, maybe not as strong. Um, but you just kind of get a sense of what they find appealing. So. Got it. Yeah. All right, so we are just a few seconds away from the Daily Creative Challenge, where we will be taking a look at some, uh, some character-inspired uh, designs here that are just have just been submitted to Discord. And the challenge today was create an, an adventure game character using yourself or using um, an inspiration character that you want to use. Then not only once you created the character, you had to use Puppet Warp to pose the character and then use um, a blur if you want it for the background. So we have a few here. Uh, Tibbs submitted this one. Go ahead and click on it. Very cool. This is fun. Oh, I don't know if that's you, Tibbs, or not, but very cool. Yeah. All right, here's another one. Well, and I like how you're doing, you know, the dimension for the hair, but then using the flat shapes. It looks like something that maybe you started off with that overall flat shape so that you then can start adding detail to it, too, which is really cool. Um, I like the colors that you're starting to use here. It's kind of the nice pastel. Um, was there any motion blur in the second one? I'm not seeing it, but that doesn't mean anything. Okay, there's <laughs> another one that just popped in. <laughs> nice. you got to love a good big axe. Yep. Um, so... Chiseled muscles, adding some detail into there. So, nice clean colors, bright and fun. Very cool. Let's go up. This one's getting a lot more detail too. I'd love to know, you know, what you were using for some of the references of these. Like if they were blending photos yeah. or, you know, you're the Photoshop yeah, composite um, expert. This definitely looks like a photo in the background. I'm. Um, yeah, my only critique on this one, or two critiques, uh, just, and again, just very minor stuff. Um, your character is kind of getting lost in the shadows at the bottom, so I might bring it, bring it up just the exposure of the whole the whole character up just a hair, so we can see more detail as it goes down. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure what's going on with the eye, so I'm not sure if that was intentional or not. But one eye looks a little, slightly different than the other one. And also, when you're looking at you know color and what color the light is and what color the shadowing is. Usually if you have a warm temperature light, so if it's a sunset, if it's a tungsten light, like you're inside indoors, mm -hmm. and it has more of that yellow warmer tint to it, usually the shadows are gonna be on the cooler side and vice versa. So if you have a cool light, usually the shadows in something are gonna be on that warmer side of things. So you can kind of subconsciously make it look a little bit more mm -hmm. natural than doing a warm light with a warm shadow. So you could always add some of that cooler shadow shadowing to add some to it as well. And there's definitely a lot of detail in this one that I like. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you spent a lot of time and the fur or feathers, whatever this is on the top, and just the uh, little accent pieces and the, the uh, weapon of choice. Very nice. <laughs> Frog with a lightsaber. <laughs> Can't beat nice. That. Nice. Yeah, I like that you're adding, you know, the different types of background to it too, and you have that color gradient throughout. So it's allowing that character to pop. So like we were just mentioning with the last feedback, making sure that you have that color contrast so that your character is really the focus. I also like the hierarchy and the layout that you have here too, because you're you know, your main character is in that lower left-hand side. I get my lefts and rights mm -hmm. mixed up. I always say right, but then I point that way. <laughs> so, lower left-hand side of the image, um, and then you're drawing the eye to that upper right-hand right. side too. And kudos for when you did composite it onto the background, the scale looks right, um, the placement of the feet on the, on the ground looks right. I would probably add just a little bit more shadow around the, the toes or fingers, whatever those would be called. Uh, but otherwise, great job. And then also looking at the light and seeing where the shadows are on the character mm -hmm. and then mimicking that in the shadow yeah, on the ground too. Yeah, because you can see a lot of shadow under the body here where it's further off the ground as it naturally would be. And there's a little around this one, but there's not as much around these. Mm -hmm. So I would just basically replicate the amount of shadow you have here, over here, and here as well. And it also looks like you have it on this side as opposed to like in here. Mm -hmm. But just, I'm nitpicking. Very good. Yeah. Well, it's some of those things where, you know, somebody will look at it and they'll be like, it's a little off, but I don't quite know why mm -hmm. versus 
Yeah, that feels good. Yeah. It's just those little details like that. Yep. And this is the same character off the background. And I, I get the same advice. I just make the bottom just a little bit brighter so we can mm -hmm. see the details. Although I do almost gravitate toward this one a little bit more than the second iteration that we looked at. Yeah. Because the character is popped out a little bit more, it feels like it could be in a storybook or something. And it's not as deep and dark and you're not losing as much of the character. Very cool. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. This is fun. Is this the original one or is the second one? Oh, I think this see. is the reference. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Ah. That's super cool. They got swords. They got swords. They got swords. English is. Yes. Um, but it's nice that you're, you know, you're giving them some weapons. You have the environment in there. I like that you can see the characters in that background, but you start to lose the weapons within the background because they're the same tone right. in there. Like so it this takes one, a second to I, realize. I had to guess that that's a sword or whatever, that, you know, because, mm -hmm. of, like you said, because it's competing with the background. And a so yeah. either A, if this character were just moved over, then it would mm -hmm. be fine. And same thing here. This one, were just if they were just moved off, the swords were off this background, it would be great. Yeah, alternately you could add kind of a soft focus on the background behind them. So maybe at those first pillars that you see on the left and right hand side, maybe that's where your blur starts to begin. And then the rest of it gets blurrier as you get into the background. So it really brings that focus to the characters and they'll be clear in the yep. space. And just a, a note on your reflections here, like this one's way too bright. So if you look at what you did here, this looks about right, maybe blur it a little bit more. This one is just way too bright. It looks like it, it's actually standing on something as opposed to it being a reflection. Mm -hmm. Also doing kind of a gradient as you go out yes. from that shadow. So if you do a gradient mask in Photoshop yes. as well, um, it'll start to fade out the further away from them. And you can also clearly see that you took it and then just flipped it. So right. make sure that you get the front of the foot out of there because it would be the bottom of his foot. Right. So you'd basically just see the leg yes. coming out of it versus that foot portion as well. Very good but. compositing tips. You're just jack of all trades. <laughs> we didn't get to using Photoshop today. <laughs> we were supposed to be, but so I was naughty. I didn't work in Photoshop today That's yet. Okay. We'll do it tomorrow. We didn't get to the social media stuff. This I don't is know interesting. why I like this. This is cool. Yeah, this is a really interesting abstract interpretation of, you know, that character. Oh, we lost your... We lost me. We lost me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on screen anymore. Yeah. There we go. There you I'm go. Um, um, yeah, now again, same kind of thing. So what, what you want to do is draw the eye into whatever it is the subject is for this one. So while I was immediately drawn to your cat here, then I started getting distracted by the, the, the foreground being in so, fo you know, so sharp and so in focus. Mm -hmm. So I might take this and just blur it slightly, just to bring it slightly out of focus. I know it's supposed to be in focus because it's foreground, but I would just tone it down just a bit so that my eye stays here. Mm -hmm. You also could blend some of those colors so there's not as much of a stark contrast between the lighter blues. Like in the lower left-hand corner, you have mm -hmm. that bright blue, um, you know, it's one of the rocks that's catching the light, but because of that contrast, that's also what's drawing your eye. But this is a great example of using soft focus to have the focus on your character versus on the background or having that extra visual noise and everything. So. Awesome. All right, good. So first. Yeah. So this is a super cool texture. It's hard to see from this far away, but it looks like it might be like a gold or... Yeah, you can see it maybe closer here. Oh, kind of a gold foil, which is super cool. Um, I like that you're using the tone on tone and just the simple facial features to it too. It looks like you're cutting gold foil out of things and creating it in you know a traditional sense of collaging something or paper cutting from scratch and then you know scanning mm. it in and embellishing it. So it's kind of cool that you got that you know texture and that layering effect. Right. Even if you did it all digital. Yeah, and even uh, just a slight thing where the character's holding the weapon. So it looks like they're holding it like this, as opposed to wrapping a hand around it. So I would probably take the fingers that are on top and um, just simply mask them out so we see the sword. So it looks like the hand is being wrapped around the object as opposed to just the object leaning on their hand. Mm -hmm. That's great feedback. Camillo, very nice. 
Yes. Yes. Lots of good lightsabers. Yeah. Actually, that's a, that's a, more of a sword. Sword lightsaber. <laughs> Samurai lightsaber. Samurai. Is yes. that a thing? <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Simple shapes. I'd love again, to see some motion blur integrated again, into it. Because the way the hands are, are gripped around it is just basically masking the sword out at that point so that it looks like the hands are actually covering it. Good job. Nice. Is that and a pizza you're, map? You're like, what, why are there maps? <laughs> because the <laughs> previous challenge was create a map. So that's why we're seeing some maps in mm. here. I like the maps to pizza. Yeah, I like this one. This is kind of cool. It looks like oh, a that is. treasure map. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Don't go here. <laughs> Bad things happen here. But well, that's always the fun place to go. That's <laughs> know, where the adventure that's where the happens. Adventure yeah, it's like when the line stops and kind of just becomes dissipated out of there, then you know, it's not good. <laughs> well, the line goes out know, of it, know, so they that's survive. What I'm they survive, right? You should survive, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that all the characters? Yeah, there's Voodoo, Voodoo yep. Val, so Voodoo Val did this, and nice. she's, she's the expert, so. Yeah, just a nice simple one, mixing those flat shapes with a little bit of dimension in the hair and face, so. I like seeing the two variations of it, too, how you are using, you know, the puppet warp you can see with the before and the after with the sword that, you know, you are using the puppet warp there to bend the arms in a right. really now, great way, in a um, natural way, because it can get dicey with yes. the puppet warp tool if you go a little bit too far with it. The one thing that really stands out for me in this one is the detail in the face, because that looks, you know, like a real face. But the only thing I would probably want to see maybe done just a little differently is um, it looks like the hair was probably on a white background, and that white is now showing on top of the black suit. So... I'd probably try and just remove some of this white as it comes down so it looks like the hair is against the black as opposed mm -hmm. to a white background. It's an ombre. It's an ombre? It's an ombre. What's an ombre? It's where you have your hair color that's darker at the top and then it fades into like white. Oh, hair. you were just saved, Voodoo she, Ombre she hair. Ombre hair. ombre hair. But you can also tell when you zoom into the skin tone of this one that you're not just using, you know, purple on purple on purple. Right. You can see some yellow undertones in there that you're using yeah, some corals the on the cheek. The, the, the and one, oh. Yeah, it's one of those extra layers of detail that makes it feel more real because when you look at things in real life, it's never just one solid color. Yeah, and even this, the, the shadows and the reflections on the nose, just, I mean, the highlights on the nose, just little things like that just really make this, the detail really stands out for me. Mm -hmm. So great job, Booty Val. All right, we have other maps. You gotta go around the rabbits. Yes. Killer rabbits. <laughs> Killer rabbits. <laughs> if you and get it, through the witch, yeah. and you can avoid and, the and, rabbits of and death. You, and you might wanna go down this way. <laughs> they're all pointing that way, so like they're just waiting for you to come around that bend. Maybe you have to collect them to feed them to the dragon so you can get past. Ah, or maybe they it. just attack the dragon. Got it part of the adventure. Dragon attacking rabbits. <laughs> See, there's another one popping. I thought I saw something. Okay. And oh, I'm seeing more, more stuff. Let's go in. I thought I saw another map here. Did we look at this one? It was a second interpretation, I think, of the original pizza map. Oh, got it. But <laughs> You go from the gym to pizza. This is actually a really funny interpretation of a mask. <laughs> routine, you know? routine map. Yeah. Back to the gym. Get your cake. You know, coffee and or soup. Yeah. Could be either. I'm going mean, to guess coffee. I mean the pizza and cake category, yeah. so. Very good. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. It's another iteration of this. I mean, I don't know if this is the... Is this the first one? What is the caption on there? Or that's the open original. Um, no, this is But actually, the second one's nice because they're starting to integrate some of that texture and some of those darker colors. So it makes it feel like it was actually, you know, either printed on the map or goes in with the style a little bit more versus this one, which, I mean, they stand out more, but it's nice to have them integrated in some way. Right, we saw the rabbits. I'll look at one more of these. I don't think we looked at that one. I like them. I like the maps. These are cool. Yeah. Yeah, this was an interesting challenge, yeah. too. Because you have so many different parts and pieces going on and, you know, making sure that you have that hierarchy and you're letting people follow, you know, the path or the visual yeah, elements those, on it is bones? a challenge. Yeah, this is probably not a good path. 
<laughs> like things don't things don't go well when you go down this path. I mean, does following a treasure map ever go a hundred percent well? Mm, yeah, no. <laughs> We've all watched the Goonies. Yeah. Things that don't. You know what? You know, speaking of things that don't end well, in every single movie you've seen, every single TV show movie, where there is a a hostage exchange for the money. Okay, we're gonna meet on a bridge. You're gonna walk out. <laughs> I'm gonna bring the person. You're gonna bring the. That never ends well. And like it never just goes the way it's supposed to in any movie you've ever seen. We need to just make a right. movie where there's a hostage exchange. Right. And it's like, oh, they're kind, money. polite. Okay, they give them right. and the movie <laughs> it's ends. Done. Yeah, movie ends. <laughs> that never works in any movie. Because nobody wants to watch that. That's right. not fun. I know. It's it's, <laughs> it's a dark topic. Sorry. Oh, oh these are that's a nice one. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, very nice. Again, yeah. with the hand, but love mm -hmm. the horse. Yeah, the horse is really interesting. Yeah, and then also making sure that you're using the puppet warp to, you know, brace onto the horse. So yeah. having the legs Wrap bent the legs. up versus right. straight. Um, and then going behind that wing, too, because, you know, that Pegasus isn't going to be able to fly. Exactly. If the so wing that's is another behind. masking tip. All you have to do is mask it so that um, you basically create a layer of mask on the character and just mask, brush the parts where the wing need to show through on the other side. Then it looks like the wing, the wing is actually in front of the leg. But mm -hmm. good job. And we have new took skulls. the advice already. Yeah, Very absolutely. Very cool. Now, see, now the swords stand out perfectly. Mm -hmm. The reflections are great. Wow, that was a quick, that was a quick fix. Yeah, added some gold to the yep. sword as well, so. And Nicely some more done. tones into the back. I like the green that you integrated into that back light as well. So just adding a little bit of a subtle detail That's there. That's gotta be the fastest. I took your critique and I adjusted <laughs> the image accordingly I've ever seen. Yeah. Very nice. All right, so we've got about, let's see, we've got about 14, 14 minutes. 14 more minutes. So what can you do in 14 minutes for us? We can do a lot of things. Thanks everyone for the Daily Creative Challenge. You've got our feedback. These were great entries. Uh, keep the characters coming. I know you just you only had like a couple hours to work on this so far. So we'll take a look at more of these tomorrow. Okay. And in the meantime, we're, yeah. back, to, we're back to Mary. So we could either start business cards or we could start doing some of the social media assets or keep that for tomorrow. I love social media, so let's keep it for tomorrow. Okay. So we'll, we'll do just start. some quick business cards and then we'll be done with the print materials. And tomorrow Perfect. we'll do social media um, online and packaging. Sounds like a plan. Okay, so I'm going to open a new file. Oh, nope, create new file. So we are going to do 3.5 times 2, which is our standard business card size. I'm going to duplicate that guy, and I'm also going to name these. You see one. And are people like because uh, I'm not really in the industry doing this as often as you are. are people still do using the standard size business cards, the three and a half by two. Some of them. Um, I think the question is more: Are they using business cards in general? Um, because you also have seen a lot of trend where you don't use a ton of business cards because mm -hmm. you're not meeting people, you mm -hmm. know, in person as much unless you have a brick or mortar, which. You know, as we all know from all right. like the large e-commerce websites. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to share with all of you my favorite business card that I received from someone ever. It only had one thing on it. What was that? At their name. Yeah. Because that's where they are everywhere. If you have the same handle on all social media, your website, whatever, that's, that's all they had on the card. And I was so impressed by mm -hmm. that because it was like, Huh, no phone number, no email address, no none of that, mm -hmm. no address at the person's name. I think and it's you also could go find them everywhere based on that. Yeah, it's equally impressive that they got the same, same handle name, yeah. for right, everything. Right, right, that right. Never and they had a unique name, so that made it easier. Like uh, even mm -hmm. when even back in the day when I tried to get my Twitter name just to be Terry White, someone already had that, so I had to go Terry L White. My Instagram, same thing. Yep. Terry Lee White, because that all the other ones were taken. Yeah, I love my husband dearly, but uh, for my professional name, I kept my maiden name because, yeah. you know, my yeah. married name is Dime a Dozen, and my married name, or my maiden name was actually a little proprietary, kind of. 
Yeah, you don't meet too many Rousies, so. It's true. So I am going to rename this. So Bombini business card round 01. So these are kind of my naming conventions that I have, whatever the client name is, whatever the project is, and then if it's round one, round two, round three, if it's a 1B. So it just keeps them all organized for me as well. And then for presentations, I'll do P1, P2. And then if it's a final, F or F1, <laughs> F2, F3, as those things typically right. go. Final, 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 dot, mm -hmm. final, dot. <laughs> Final, the final, the last one. Just kidding, real final. Yeah, dash 32. So I'm going to use the yellow for now. I'm also gonna make a separate layer for my background colors so that I can lock them without messing up the rest of the graphics. Um, making sure I'm on this initial artboard, and I'm going to adjust this. Now, and speaking of other tricks when it comes to business card to stand out, uh, two things, because uh, that's why I asked her about the size, is that people tend to use a slightly bigger card so that it just feels or stands out in a stack. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, a very nice paper because then it just feels different than all the other cards they've gotten. So if you or someone you're you're in that kind of environment where people are handing out business cards and you want that person to walk away and look at yours later, you got to use those kind of tricks to get them to just even like touch your card again as opposed to the stack of cards they already got. If mm -hmm. people are still handing out business cards and social events. Yep. Yeah, and there's so many great options out there too that you know. Yeah, rounded corners, for example, mm -hmm. on the cover. That you can get some really great things for the price. Although I will, you know, prompt people to look at the brand that they're designing for and see if an oversized card makes sense or an mm -hmm. undersized card. Because um, sometimes if you're going to be giving out a ton at conventions, it helps it stand out, but sometimes it'll get messed up on the corners True. too. So True. take that into consideration on if you're doing, say, a laminate or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because then you know that those corners are gonna get a little messed up. And if you have the right printing process, then they won't, so. Right. Also, um, one of the companies, I think it was Moo.com, Moo they were one of the first ones that I noticed that would allow you to print a different photo on the back of your card. So mm -hmm. like you could have 50 photos and have a different one on the back of each card. So that way, they're almost like baseball cards that people used to, back in the day would collect. So. Uh, it's like you would hand people one, and each one you hand out would be a different photo on the back of, from your portfolio. Yeah, which is a really interesting way to do it, too. Or even with postcards or, you know, you were talking about grabbing people's attention. What can you give them? Maybe it's a matchbox that has all of your contact information on it instead, mm -hmm. too, or a matchbook. Um, we had matchbooks produced, or they're in production right now, for Ember Creative because, you know, our tagline is your creative spark. Yep. So handing out you know, match books instead. At least it keeps you memorable. It's something they can actually functionally use and it's gonna guarantee that they're gonna pick it up more than once. All right, so we've got three minutes left. Okay. we have a transition period in between. Oh, well, excellent. Okay, well, you know, you guys know how to make business cards, so. No, no, tell us what you're doing for three minutes. <laughs> okay, just cut me off when you need to. I will. Um, so this is my challenge to see if I can design a business card in this amount of time. Well, just tell us the process. Like, you, you don't have to finish the card, but just tell us what you're thinking as you're doing the thing. Yeah, so right now I'm looking at what do I want to be on the back um, if she's handing this to somebody, you know, is there going to be something really interesting on the back? Is there something that ties over into the front? So for a second interpretation of something along the lines of this, I could take these two elements and start thinking of it as a holistic brand. So if we have that on one side, and maybe we blow this up. Oh, I like that. And go there on it. Mm -hmm. Then we could take the other side, and maybe we put it in this yellow. Very cool. So then that way, when you have multiple of them together, they complete the pattern in just the reverse yes. of color upon color. I like um, it. So something interesting there. All right, we have about a minute left. Okay. Don't call this number, it's her real number. <laughs> you know, 
So you can kind of have your information on it. We do the at, on, at Bombini, get those social medias in there. What do you think about so, point sizes for the text? Um, depending on audience, um, depending on who, if it's a B2B, you always go a little bit bigger because um, mm -hmm. you're probably going to be meeting with managers, CEOs. Um, obviously, there's less of an age gap on some of those things now. You have newer, younger guys, you know, and women and building start you know, tech companies, things like that. But always take into consideration your audience. If it's harder for them to read something, especially like this, how we're using a Dodoni typeface. Right. And along, and along those same lines, before we go, I remember this TV commercial I was watching. It was like the TV was at a certain volume, and it was for the elderly. And all of a sudden, the volume got super loud mm -hmm. so that they could hear. Yep. <laughs> so what so, that said. But never go under seven if it's all caps. Yeah. Um, Usually around at least an eight. All right, so everyone bit. stick around. Although we're done for the segment, there's another segment coming up in the next five minutes. So, yeah. Mary, come and we'll back see tomorrow. you again tomorrow. Tomorrow, great, yep. awesome. Thanks everybody for Thanks. being here. We'll catch you later. Bye. Bye.